I once heard about some teachers who had a dangerous minds party on a Friday night. A dangerous minds party is where you take a shot every time Michelle Pfeiffer does something unrealistic. The joke is that it's a party no one remembers. My name is Derek. I teach high school in Washington State, and we're talking about the myth of the super teacher in the media and how it sometimes may make teachers want to drink. There are uh, a number of ways authors and artists respond to the myth of the magical teacher. If we look closely, we can observe how authors and screenwriters respond uh, sometimes intentionally to the myth. One thing I've been noticing is that writers sometimes address it by outlining it or pointing at it. McCourt, who would probably love a Dangerous Minds party, he does his share of thinking about the myth. I wanted to be the great liberating teacher, to raise the students from their knees after days of drudgery in offices and factories, to help them cast off their shackles, to lead them to the mountaintop, to breathe the air of freedom. Mitchie, on one hand are the horror stories, fueled by media reports that portray schools in chaos. On the other hand is the occasional account of the miracle worker, that amazing super teacher savior who takes a ragtag group of city kids and turns their lives around overnight. Somewhere between these two, between the miracles and the metal detectors, is where I teach. I had a semi-whimsical vision of a Hollywood ending to the semester, the over-the-top, stand-and-deliver type story, this time starring Stephen Poisner and his utterly transformed students from East San Jose's problematic Mount Pleasant High School. So Poisner, he points to end-of-year success and calls it over-the-top, but he still craves it. I didn't often get the feeling that I was greatly empowering my Mount Pleasant students, he confesses. But I thought I really had an effect on Joe, in a way that usually only happens for teachers in the movies. These teachers, in naming the image of the super teacher and saying they will not live up to it, or will at most meet it halfway, turn our story into stereotype. Other authors and screenwriters don't point at or outline the myth so much as attempt to parallel it perfectly. They copy other movies and books. Watching this film, you'd think Escalante had developed and expanded his math program in a year, but in reality, he did so over the course of a decade. Perhaps writers for the film alter reality because one-year transformation fits the myth. Jerry Justness in Reason Magazine. Escalante didn't even teach his first calculus course until he had been at Garfield for several years. His basic math students from his early years were not the same students who later passed the AP calculus test. But the compression makes the story more appealing. This film starring Morgan Freeman also compresses years of teaching into a single year on screen. A couple episodes of This American Life investigate this kind of copying. How do our notions of teaching from literature and film replicate and perpetuate themselves, sometimes unethically, in other pieces of literature and film? In one episode, Ira Glass reports on the differences between Luann Johnson's book and The Dangerous Minds film. The movie took some liberties, Glass says. For instance, the filmmakers made her mixed race class into an all minority class. The filmmakers invented fictional black parents who did not want their kids to learn. The filmmakers organized the film around two stories which did not happen in real life, including one where a student is shot and killed. Johnson adds to Glass's comments I think the movie really promotes racial tension by having the kids call me white bread, which never happened. Additionally, the movie was turned into a short-lived TV show. Johnson says the TV character does things she would never do, like holding a school fundraiser in a strip club. In another episode of This American Life, Glass investigates Mount Pleasant. In the book, Poisner describes his drive to school. 
I passed nearby my neighborhood French bakery and the local Ferrari dealership. Several miles and a couple of highways later, I drove into what felt like another planet. Signs advertised janitorial supply stores and taquerias, exhaust hung over 10 lanes of inner city traffic, yellowing weedy gardens fronted many of the homes, as did driveways marred by large oil spots or broken down cars. And Poisoner wonders if the lives of the people who live around this school are profoundly sad. Glass goes to the community and does his report from the school, where he finds purple wildflowers, a golf course several blocks away, SUVs and driveways, and a water park down the road. This is what I found on Street View. Glass interviews teachers at Mount Pleasant, English teacher Mark Holston. The derogatory statements to our students, the inaccuracies, the exaggerations, that's the part we're upset about. There's a narrative he had in his mind. He saw teacher movies, and it fits his narrative to show that this school is a horrible school. In the book, Poisoner mentions Stand and Deliver no less than three times. He laments that his students don't want a typical movie moment. They had no visions of my class unfolding like some triumphant scene from Stand and Deliver or another one of those high school feel-good movies. Which is maybe the kind of experience Poisoner thinks he can have. And why not? In the movie, Escalante makes great leaps and bounds in a single year. Why not Poisoner? In the movie, Escalante is inexperienced but accomplishes great things. Why not Poisoner? and Poisoner only has to teach one class for one semester. The back jacket of the book calls Poisoner's telling a fascinating true story about one teacher who dared to break all the rules. According to Poisoner's colleagues, the main rule Poisoner breaks is the one where memoir writers tell the truth. In altering details of his experiences to match a movie already based on something less than real life, Poisoner feeds the machine. As the story of the super teacher becomes more crystallized, it opens itself to parody. Mad TV, Saturday Night Live, and Family Guy and Community have all satirized the magical teacher story. In one Mad TV spoof, a nice white lady in the foreground here tries to show her students the joys of writing. A dispirited drunk colleague visits her after school. Forget it, he says. These are minorities. They can't learn and they can't be educated. With all due respect, sir, the white lady replies, I'm a white lady. I can do anything. Before long, students trade journals and read books. An Asian boy in a black bandana holds a gun in his left hand and a ballpoint pen in his right, weighing his options. A Saturday Night Live sketch Spoofing a world history class ends with the teacher crunching handfuls of pain pills. Let's read quietly for the rest of the period, he says, swallowing the pills. Matter of fact, why don't you bring in your copy of Raiders of the Lost Ark tomorrow? In Family Guy, a cartoon dog named Brian is assigned to teach remedial English. Tim, one of the students, is 28 years old and smokes weed. Another student, Carlos, is both a rapist and a boy aching to learn. In community, students stand on desks and fall. These parodies poke at our myth and poke holes in it. They turn our increasingly stereotypical story into all-out caricature. A fourth reaction to living in the shadow of myth is to leave it behind in favor of something more real. At a parent-teacher conference in this movie, a parent says, We prefer that you teach our daughter, not try to raise her. The man who plays the teacher in this film is a teacher himself. He wrote the script, and at times the film feels like a replication of a regular day, complete with students interrupting the teacher and the teacher allowing himself to get sidetracked. I actually didn't like it very much. Notably, the teacher never learns to manage student behavior. Some scriptwriters make their magical teachers seem more gritty and less saintly by making them psychologically unstable. In 2000, the first episode of Boston Public starts with 
Harry Sennett taking over a class after another teacher writes, have gone to kill myself. Hope you're happy on the chalkboard. And Sennett gains control of the unruly class by waving a gun loaded with blanks. In 2008, the first season of this show shows a chemistry teacher cooking and dealing meth to pay for his lung cancer treatment and to save money for his family in case he dies. She looks normal enough, but is really a high school teacher who is diagnosed with melanoma and who stages a fake death in front of her son, cartwheels down the hall at school, and tells a student, you can't be fat and mean. This brings us to a plateau. We started in the late 50s and early 60s with a narrative of nurture, Mother Mary, cultivator of morality, moved on to the narrative of the do-good or white savior, sacrificing life to save all, and now find ourselves in a narrative of descent, where our appetite for realism turns our magical teacher malevolent, and an angel falls to earth. Too much Julie Andrews makes us want to see Michelle Pfeiffer, and too much Michelle Pfeiffer makes us want to see Cameron Diaz. Hung over on the first day, she turns off the lights and says, Anyone seen Stan and Deliver? You and you, grab the TV and roll it up front. On other days, she shows these movies and peels out of the parking lot yelling, Adios, bitches. Of course, in the same way the magical teacher flirts with bad behaviors, smashing desks, or maybe hitting a student with a rolled up magazine, the bad teacher experiments with good behaviors. And Diaz's character eventually assigns books and essays, and even grades some. Since the bad teacher is the main character, the good teacher who intentionally tries to inspire others must be the foil, like Miss Squirrel, who teaches across the hall from Diaz's character and says things like, I have weapons of math destruction, and gives her students apples. When Diaz's character points out that students are supposed to give teachers apples and not the other way around, Miss Squirrel, the villain, says, well, I think the students teach me at least as much as I teach them. That's just something I say sometimes. The bad teacher as a character is nothing new. In Anne of Green Gables, Mr. Phillips spells Anne's name without an E and humiliates her by making her sit with Gilbert Blythe. We hate her, the only truly bad teacher in the whole Potter series. South Park's Mr. Garrison is horrible. Okay, children, let's start the day with a few new math problems. What is five times two? Come on, children, don't be shy. Just give it your best shot. Yes, Clyde? Twelve? Okay, now let's try to get an answer from someone who's not a complete retard. Anyone? Come on, don't be shy. This mentor with a heart of gold and thirst for alcohol is not your traditional magical teacher. The difference, though, is that these bad teachers are portrayed as villains or function as relatively minor characters. Our bad teachers now are protagonists who embody teachings long slide from a mantle of respect and authority, de-evolved from dignified to dumb or even devilish. As Elizabeth Alsup writes in the New York Times, the message is that teaching is no longer just the career of choice for the lazy or low achieving, as the cliche goes, but also for the lawbreaker. This car wash is to raise money for a boob job. This main character turns his class into a rock band that will make him a star and help him win $20,000. The name of this movie, Detachment, refers to the emotional state of the main character, a substitute who has never really learned to bond with students. In Larry Crown, Julia Roberts plays a teacher with a class of nine. She teaches three days a week and goes home and drinks margaritas. She's mostly lazy and low achieving. The lawbreakers, like the chemistry teacher who sells meth, go further. The television show Hung follows an unhappy history teacher who resorts to male prostitution. In Half Nelson, a female student finds the man who is both her teacher and coach with a crack pipe on the floor of a locker room after a basketball game. 
screenwriter Anna Bowden, in an article from Edutopia, describes the brainstorming for the film. The spark for the movie wasn't to make a classroom drama or an inspirational classroom movie or a classroom anything. The spark was the idea of this very complex, flawed character. Teachers are sometimes held up as, you know, saints. In a way, the malevolent teacher mythology counteracts and distorts the magical teacher mythology and makes me ask how much of it is hogwash and how much is good teaching the way i see it the distortion can be good because it means that even though the perception and representation of our job now is pretty depressing it continues to change when i walk into my classroom and ask what story do i want my teaching to tell I walk into a changing landscape that is colored by the past, but not beholden to it. The archetypes may hover, but they also change. Teachers are more than super saviors or gullible idiots, and teenagers are more than vindictive spoiled brats or tough street kids with tender hearts. We are everything in between and more. We believe in the magic of the classroom. And stories about the craft of teaching have the potential to remind us of the power and persistence of that belief. This story was a 1934 novel, a 1939 film, a 1967 musical, a 1984 TV series, and a 2010 made-for-TV movie. Our stories about teaching go on and on. Michael Chabon says, Most great stories of adventure come furnished with a map. We have that map for teaching, but the story, it does not need to be a story of rescue and sacrifice only. It can be a story of quest or pursuit, escape, riddle, metamorphosis, maturity, mystery. Truly magical teaching will always be irreducible to algorithm, but sometimes we can see it flickering like a shadow on the wall. Walk through the halls writes Bell Kaufman, listen at the classroom doors. In one, a lesson on the nature of Greek tragedy. In another, a drill on who and whom. In another, a hum of voices intoning French conjugations. In another, committee reports on slum clearance. In another, silence, a math quiz. Whatever the waste, stupidity, ineptitude, whatever the problems and frustrations of teachers and pupils, something very exciting is going on. In each of the classrooms, on each of the floors, all at the same time. Education.